My name's Noelle Miller, and um, this is going to be my mini lecture for the class History and Systems of Psychology. My topic is the birth of civilization and psychology's beginnings. The emergence of psychology is what I'm going to be talking about on my first slide. Um, psychology was not recognized as an independent study until the end of the 19th century. During the 17th and 18th centuries, competing models of psychologies vied with each other for dominance, according to Brendan and Hood, Chapter 7. Scientific inquiry developed rapidly during the 17th and 18th centuries, aided by advances in both mathematical and empirical disciplines. These developments are important for the history of psychology because they contributed to the supremacy of 19th century science, upon which psychology was modeled. In France, as well as in England and Germany, mathematics and the physical sciences began to assume modern forms. According to Brennan and Hood, chapter 8, page 125. Um, on the left, this was when psychology was recognized. Despite Descartes' arguments and scientific breakthroughs of the time, psychology did not become a recognized science until the mid-1800s. Empirical advances in psychology, and that's just a model of what that looks like. My next slide, I'm going to be talking about religious barriers to advances in science. Post-Copernican advances in science and mathematics were crucial to the eventual success of science. With the decline of church authority based upon faith, the age of reason began an era also sometimes called Enlightenment. The human intellect was valued and used to generate knowledge, resulting in a trend that steadily witnessed the triumph of science, according to Brennan and Hude, chapter 7, page 106. As you can see on the left side, that is a picture of the era of enlightenment, which is what I just talked about. Because going against the church was so looked down upon in this era, many of these practices were held in secret societies. The first societies in Italy were secret permitting scientific communication while protesting scientists. The tradition of learned societies has continued to this day. In the United States, there are essentially private foundations with limited government support, according to Brendan Hude, chapter 7, page 113. Um, on the right side, that is the French Academy, like one of the very first learned societies where they practice science and psychology because it was very looked down upon in their religion at that time. Next, I'm going to be talking about the governments in Europe. Governments all over Europe were trying to censor these advances in science because it was so against religious beliefs. In the France of Louis XIV and Louis XV, prior to the revolution, the government maintained a vast censorship. Books were examined for religious agreement, support of public order, and moral righteousness to secure the permission and privilege of the king, necessary for publication, according to Brennan and Hood, Chapter 9. However, these censorships were still loosely examined because they only had few people to do that. The major theme of psychology pursued by British philosophers centered on a commitment to empiricism. Empiricism has been generally defined as the view that experience is the only source of knowledge. Accordingly, the theme of individual psychological framework through the accumulation of experiences, according to Brennan Hood, Chapter 9, page 140. Um, empiricism, ideas and knowledge develop in our mind as a result of our sensory experiences. Our sensory experiences include sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. And on the left side, um, that's just basically an image of censorship and freedom of the press during that time. Next, I'm going to be talking about how psychology has developed more in the past few centuries as opposed to, um, how it, it began. Over the course of the 19th century, the natural sciences approach within psychology increasingly separated from the humanities perspective. In 1874, Wilhelm once published Principles of Physiological Psychology. He gave lectures in Heidelberg on the physiolog physiology of perception and on the subject of psychology from the natural sciences point of view. One once became a professor in Leipzig in 1875, he aligned himself explicitly with the empir empirical and experimental sciences and sought to introduce science as the scale of judgment in philosophy. This contributed to the disregard of research methods with a more 
philosophical humanistic orientation within psychology. While psychology was developing as a new science, from today's perspective, one has to concede that it did not establish its own characteristic toolbox or methodological approach, but instead imported methods from other disciplines, namely the experimental approach, which was originally developed in the natural sciences and then adapted and applied for psychological research by Wundt. On the left side, I have a picture of Wilhelm Wundt, and on the right side is um, an example of the experimental approach in psychology. From today's perspective, it appears that a century ago, psychology largely abandoned a systematic consideration of the inner world. Not because this inner world would be problematic territory per se, but because it was problematic to study, that is. It was abandoned due to a methodological insufficiency. In turn, the inner world of experiences was increasingly seen as an appendix to the physiological realm, with the latter being easier to study and hence more readily accessible. Today, the general understanding is that psychology states and experiences ultimately emanate from physiological processes, an approach that leaves psychology with substantial problems that so far remain as intractable as they were at the time when the physiology-centered view began to dominate psychology, according to Meyer. Um, I got that source from the UMD library, and yes. Um, next, we're going to be watching a video, um, A Level of Psychology, The Origins of Psychology. But first, how do we know what is scientific? Well, the easiest way of doing this is by using a checklist of five features. First, there must be control. This means that the experiments are only influenced by the experimenter in the way they intended. Second, there must be hypothesis testing, meaning that the theory should be tested to gather support or be disproved. In other words, the concepts can't be abstract, Creating a hypothesis that aliens have altered teenagers' wavelengths to make them more sensitive to Kermit memes isn't much good as a scientific subject because it can't be tested. It's just a conspiracy. Next, we have the requirement for objectivity. This is found when observations are recorded without biases or the influence of external factors. So, the Kermit study is arguably not objective, as the results could be influenced by what the person is comfortable telling us. An adult might not want to admit that they find Kermit memes hilarious, so it's therefore said to be subjective. Our fourth characteristic is predictability. This just means you should be able to use results of a scientific experiment to predict future behaviour. And then, last but not least, there's replicability. As each experiment should be able to be replicated exactly so that the results can be checked and rechecked. So, our five features of a scientific subject are control, hypothesis testing, objectivity, predictability, and replicability. I found a great way to remember these in an exam is by using the acronym CHOPR. And 47 was in on top and always the case differently. People have also argued that because of the subject's philosophical origins, that there's always going to be an element of subjectivity as was experienced by Wundt with the subjectivity of the introspection method. So, overall, we might say that some of the psychological approaches are more... Oh. Oops. Oops. Okay. Alright, and then here is my references. I mainly just referenced our textbook. And then I did use a scholarly article, and um, there is also the link for my video.